Okay, welcome everybody. This is awesome. Welcome uh, to really a whole day, right? Research day. And, uh, and so this is a, a blockbuster. We have like 84 posters. I want to thank uh, Antoinette Peoples and Brightwana Tang and Chai Walker who completely organized this with uh, Lee Seabrook, our annual event. And you'll notice this year we have it the Tuesday before the PAS national meeting. So people can do their posters and practice and be ready and already have had a conversation in a practice round. So uh, we're celebrating. It's a great time for research. And thank all of you who are into research because I want you to remember that no matter how great our clinical practice, research is the vehicle to make the care better. Okay, so research is really, really important. So I'll ask Dr. Wetmore to introduce our visitor that she invited and is sponsoring. Uh, Cindy, thank you. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome um, my friend Wilbur uh, Lamb. He, we were colleagues together at Emory University where we overlapped for briefer than I thought we would because then I came here. So we were uh, colleagues for about three and a half years. But Wilbur is uh, truly an engineer physician scientist. He did his undergraduate degree in biochemistry and biology at Rice University. He then went to Baylor College of Medicine where he received his medical degree. And then um, he went to UCSF Berkeley where he did a PhD in bioengineering and uh, biology. And he was then uh, doing his residency at, in pediatrics at UCSF as well as his HEMOC fellowship and uh, postdoctoral training. Uh, he was on uh, staff originally at UCSF as an instructor and then an assistant professor until uh, Emory and Georgia Tech lured him away. He was appointed to a tenure professor with, uh, associate professor with tenure at Emory and at Georgia Tech, where he directs a number of innovative programs. He's also a leader in the Atlanta Biosciences Innovation Hub and uh, helps direct a program in the CTSA. He has over 71 uh, peer reviewed publications and a tremendous funding record. He was recently uh, awarded an, a special, very coveted R35 from NIH, which is like a two and a half R01s. That means he doesn't need to write one of those grants again for about five years or seven years. Depends on who's counting. Anyway, it's a tremendous pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Lamb. He uh, is a brilliant speaker, and I'm so glad to have you here in Phoenix today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Cindy. It's great. Uh, it was, although it was a real bummer to lose Cindy, it's great to know she landed in a great place. Uh, so thank you so much for having me. What I'll do today is uh, really talk about the, the research program uh, that I lead. And I'll, I'll drag you through a little bit of basic science. But what I hope to do is really convince you that some of the basic science directly dovetails into uh, translational and clinical sciences, uh, even in the engineering space. So a little bit of what our lab does. So at the end of the day, from a basic science standpoint, I'm a hematologist, I'm a biophysicist, and we create gadgets uh, to study f uh, biophysics of hematology, but also create in vitro models of blood diseases. And I'll show you that in a bit. A lot of what we do is we're a gadget lab. Uh, so a lot of these uh, fancy words are really uh, the bread and butter of the bioengineering field. And we use that to answer questions that are technologically f infeasible in hematology with current assays. And then when we make new discoveries, we then invent new gadgets. So there's this nice kind of crosstalk uh, that, that goes between these two fields. But we're always also thinking about taking these gadgets we make and turning them into new diagnostic platforms. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But then it always comes back to our kids, right? the kids that we see here, that you guys see here, and I see over at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And then this whole cycle kind of uh, repeats itself multiple times. So obviously in translational research, the paradigm is called um, bench to bedside. So what I like to say our lab does is since we're even on the gadget side, we, we say we're, we're basement uh, to, to bench to bedside. And if any of you guys can think of a better word than basement, let me know. But I'm stuck with the alliteration. So I can't think of a, a, a better B word. Well, I can think of lots of B words, but, they, they, but they're not the ones I'm, I'm looking for. Um, OK, so how did I get into this? Uh, so as Dr. Wetmore kind of said, when I was uh, a fellow, I was, in, I was trying to figure out my PhD at the same time. What, what was going to be my thesis project. My uh, mentor at the time uh, was really a mechanical engineering by training. He didn't know anything about biology. So I was really struggling with a thesis project. I mean, what am I going to do with my PhD? And I was on call. I was a second year fellow at the time. And for those of you who are uh, not hematologists, this is a blood smear. And, and for those of you who are not hematologists, uh, this kid came in 
and you know this is not a normal, right? You don't have to be a hematologist to know this, this ain't normal, right? All these uh, big blue things, not normal at all. Uh, so this child ultimately was diagnosed with uh, pre B cell uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, very, very high white count, right? This is the highest white count. This is a number I will have burned in my brain uh, until I die. It's, uh, it's very, very high. And, you know, when I, uh, when I saw this, uh, when the ER doc called me, I said, oh my God, what, what, what are we going to do? So the bottom line is, unfortunately, this uh, child died of uh, something called leukostasis, uh, microvascular occ occlusion uh, in leukemia. And it happens in the brain, happens in the lungs. And that's what this child died of. And I remember thinking, do we really know what, what's going on here? I mean, yeah, they plug up. So then I dug into the literature. And it really, as it turns out, you know, all the major textbooks and so forth really pointed to this couple of papers that were done in the 70s where um, a hematologist biophysicist just took pipette and just sucked on different cells. And he said that, well, different cells suck into my pipette at different rates. So therefore, it's probably has to do with the physical properties of these cells, and boom, that was it. And he published, and he sucked on a few cells, and he published in New England Journal of Medicine. I guess it was a lot easier back then to publish in New England Journal of Medicine. <laughs> um, but that was it. That was really the fundamental science that was known. And I said, oh, okay. So I go to my mentor, who is, again, a mechanical engineer, and he said, well, maybe we could do something here. And so the lab that I uh, focused on, or uh, did my PhD in, was, some, was a lab that really pioneered this technique, something called atomic force microscopy, a fancy gadget we use in, in nanoscience. Uh, the way it works, it's basically a really fancy record player. And when I, whenever I give these talks and I say to record player, there's some people in the audience that are, what the hell are you talking about? And then there's some people in the audience, maybe the guys in the front row that know exactly what I'm talking about, right? A rec it's a really fancy record player. Uh, but what you can do is that it's really small and like a record player, if you raster it across the sample, you can measure the mechanical, the physical properties of a substrate, like a cell in this case here, um, or uh, any other type of surface. So you can get nanomechanical information uh, from your sample. So that's what I did. Uh, my PhD was really uh, uh, learning about the mechanical properties of leukemia cells. And ultimately what we learned and this is, I'm always a little bummed when I show this slide, this is my entire PhD in one slide. Boiled down, you have five years of work, and I'm like, oh God, okay. Uh, but ultimately what we learned uh, is that in, uh, with a small cohort granted of kids with pre-B-cell -B ALL who developed these symptoms of leukostasis, their cells are actually much stiffer than kids with the same immunophenotype, uh, same exact leukemia, but didn't have the symptoms. Right? So here we have this potential you got these four kids here who had symptoms ranging anywhere from uh, pulmonary failure to maybe a cranial nerve, nerve palsy uh, to some MRI changes. Uh, and then you had all these kids with the same exact phenotype and all the cytogenetics were, were basically the same, uh, but didn't have symptoms. We really showed that there's a, a marked difference. Again, small cohort, no question. The underlying mechanisms still trying to get worked out, but it was an intriguing hypothesis that you can have something that's mechanical, something that's physical, that could theoretically be a clinical correlate. Okay, so that was one example of a, uh, of a technology we used. And the problem with that technology uh, is that it's really slow. Uh, so the way it works, like a record player, it, it, you have to get your sample. So uh, the N of these experiments, really it's like a handful of experiments for, uh, for every few hours. And I was the one that was manually doing this. So really, at, at the end, of that project, I was struggling to think of, you know, can we do something that's more higher throughput, that's something that can help us interrogate a much higher number of cells. So we go to this technology that, that my lab has really started to uh, leverage and, and develop and pioneer ourselves, where it's called microfluidic technologies. And what this really is, it's, it's the same exact technologies that you guys have in your pockets right now, in your cell phones. Uh, these microchips are made uh, with something called um, photolithography. And the same microchip chip technology we have in our chips and our phones can be used to make really, really small pipes. And these really, really small pipes can be on the size scale of capillaries. So here was our first experiment, always thinking of blood diseases, where I simply took a normal blood sample. This is just you know, straight from a purple top EDTA that you, you guys, you know, your phlebotomists get all the time. 
yourselves, just threw it into, the, in, into this little network I made here. And you can see it kind of looks like what you would expect, right, in a, in a microvascular setting. And then I took a sickle cell patient sample, and I did the same exact thing, and I said, whoa, well, that's different. But therein shows that there's these mechanical differences. These are just pipes that are, are really, really small size. But because they're at this size scale, you can start to see how the mechanical properties of cells alter blood flow, much like what you would expect in, in vivo. So that was really intriguing to us. And we said, OK, maybe this type of technology we can use to study things like sickle cell disease. So if we think of what the, oh, let's see, uh, wait a, oh, there we go. Um, if you think of uh, the, what's known about sickle cell pathophysiology, well, there's a lot that's known, right? We know it's a point mutation in one of the hemoglobin genes. We know that at low O2, uh, the red cell gets really, really stiff, not deformable, and also gets really sticky. It sticks to the endothelial cells, to the blood vessel cells, and that's what is canonically thought to cause this uh, vasal occlusion, microvascular occlusion, causes ischemia, causes pain. But now we know there's other important factors. We know that the white cells are involved. We know the reticulocytes are involved. We know that platelets are involved. We know all these soluble factors like cytokines and, and, and so forth are involved. So now the question really is, you have all these different players. Well, who's important? And in, in what situations uh, are, do these uh, multiple aspects of pathophysiology converge? And can we develop an in vitro assay that really takes all of these things into account? Well, we decided to, to say, well, we, we, have, we have the capability to make really, really small pipes, but really now the next step is can we grow endothelium in these little small channels? And uh, it took us a few years, but it turns out we can. So we have a, a silicone-based uh, device. So, so these things are literally like, like it's, it's rubber, uh, plastic. Is, and, and we can grow uh, blood vessel cells into these things. And here you see, this is a micros microscopy picture of all these endothelial cells growing in these really, really small channels. And we're starting to mimic what is going on in vivo. So we can get really small. In fact, we've gotten even smaller than this. We can get down to almost the capillary size now, down to 10 microns in size. And the endothelial cells are really happy. They, they line the entire 3D surface of these channels. And what this allows, I mean, from an engineering side, obviously very cool, very cute, uh, but it now suddenly allows the integration of all these things that are going on in sickle cell disease, where you have stiff cells that are also sticky, other cells that are coming, interacting with each other, looking at clotting, uh, really uh, allow us to couple and integrate cell aggregation as well as uh, cell deformability. Okay, so here's an example of just an image of what these cells look like. Uh, in these uh, channels. This is a 3D, uh, what's called a confocal microscopy. What's red is the cell membrane, and blue is the nuclei. So you can see these endothelial cells are very happy just sitting and growing in these uh, systems. So OK, well, what do we do now with patient samples? Uh, so here is an example of one of our, our endothelialized uh, microfluidics. And we're perfusing whole blood from sickle cell uh, patient on the left. And you see there's already occlusion. You know, they get stuck. They're very sticky. And then here's a sample of another uh, blood from another patient with sickle cell disease. But this kid is on hydroxyurea. And as you may know, that hydroxyurea is one of the only FDA-approved uh, drugs for uh, sickle cell disease. And what you see here is that the flow is much better. Right? So the, all these bad things are attenuated somewhat. Uh, because uh, we can take videos of these, of these experiments, uh, we can now quantify. Uh, we can develop our code and measure things like mean velocity of the channels or also the percentage of channels that get plugged up. Uh, here you see just three examples of patients, a uh, sickle cell uh, kid, uh, not on hydroxyurea, a normal person uh, with AA blood and it's controlled, and then a, a kid with sickle cell disease on hydroxyurea. So the way you see here is the separation of kind of three distinct populations. Uh, People with AA, uh, they do just fine. Their velocity stays nice and high and steady. Uh, patients with sickle cell disease, not on hydroxyurea, the uh, velocity really is, is jagged and, and decreases over time. And then in between are the kids who are on, on hydroxyurea. So it's something that we expect. But here we have a nice assay in which we can start to quantify these things. OK, so how do we actually use these things? Like, how does this 
help us in clinical practice. Uh, so one of my uh, former fellows in the lab actually had a really neat question that he wanted to use these microfluidics to answer. Uh, he's an, an uh, med peds guy, and like, you know, we're all pediatricians here. These med internal medicine guys, you know, they're super nerdy, right? And like, they think, they, uh, man, you guys remember in med school, you know, these were the guys that would like memorize lists, you know, for fun, right? Uh, and, and, and this guy certainly had that phenotype. In fact, he came up with this question. He said, hey, Wilbur, um, we actually, at least in adult side, we use a lot of different fluids. And, you know, he was like throwing all these tonicities at me that I don't even remember. And he said, I wonder if the different IV fluids we use actually affect uh, the biophysical characteristics of the sickle cell disease and therefore uh, impact their symptoms. That's a, that's a reasonable thing to test, uh, at least in vitro right now. So what he did was he came up with this hypothesis. He said, uh, if we, we know we have different IV fluids that we use, and they all have different osmolarities. And then this is uh, taken straight, straight from Wikipedia. Right? Uh, we, in physiology, we know that when you have different tonicities and you have uh, red cells, their density changes. When you have a hypertonic solution, the cells get really dense. When you have a hypotonic uh, solution, the cells blow up with water, like a balloon. And it was a reasonable hypothesis. So he said, well, if we're using these, these different fluids with different tonicities, could this actually affect how uh, sickle cells plug up? And we also already know that sickle cells are already dehydrated. This is part of their pathophysiology due to the screwed up uh, ion channels that they have. So what Marcus did was he took a bunch of these microfluidics and he started testing all these uh, different fluids. He, sim he did a very, very simple uh, experiment where he took uh, the red cells from, from patients and he just put them in different fluids that are clinically available, uh, ranging anywhere from a uh, hypertonic solution, normal saline, to D5W and everything in between. And what he found was this really interesting uh, parabola in that when you have normal saline, uh, these cells uh, plug up quite a bit, and then it gets better and better, but then when you get really hypotonic, uh, they, they get kind of stuck as well. So similar to, to what I just showed you before, you have these different tonicities, the cells can get stuck because they're really, really dense and stiff, or they can blow up like a balloon. And he did multiple other experiments. He measured how long it would take the cells to traverse these little channels, and he gets a similar effect with the different tonicities. And then we also measured hypoxic conditions and what would happen uh, with that, this transit time. So how long would it take these little cells uh, to get through these channels uh, in hypoxic conditions? And certainly with normal saline, that was a, a lot higher. It took a lot longer than uh, other solutions. And then we even looked at adhesion of, of these cells, how sticky were, the, were these cells to endothelium, and you certainly saw that there's differences. And this was great. This was a great way to do these preclinical questions. Marcus then went to uh, University of North Carolina Chapel Hill to become faculty, and then just a couple weeks ago he told me he uh, started and finished a pilot study, clinical study in the ER, and showing, you know, using the basis of all the work he did in my lab, he had these clinical questions uh, and basically showed that a normal saline bolus when used in ERs uh, was associated with worse pain for these uh, kids with, with sickle cell disease during a pain crisis. Uh, I've actually had numerous centers, uh, the Minnesota group actually told me that they're completely changing their fluid practices because of this pa uh, paper. So, you know, he does me proud, and, uh, but it's a nice example of this kind of basement to bed, uh, to, to, to bench to bedside paradigm where just these little tiny gadgets that we had led uh, to really cool preclinical studies that then led, led to a full clinical study, and now we're having practice guidelines that might actually be changed. Okay, so where are we going from a technology side? So I told you that these things are in, encased in silicone. We want to get more fancy. We want to get more physiologic. Uh, so what we're growing these cells in now is not silicone, but a, a more tissue-like substance, a, a collagen-based uh, tissue-like substance, a hydrogel is what they're called. And what this allows is a few things. So first of all, we can stu now study things like endothelial permeability and uh, endothelial inflammation. So in sickle cell disease, there's a lot of inflammation that's going on. We really don't quite understand it. Now we can start to study the endothelial inflammatory aspects of this disease. The cells are so happy that they grow in, in here for months, uh, greater than two months. In fact, uh, our, our group can, can grow these things almost indefinitely, usually until an undergrad comes and like messes it up, like trips over a tubing or something. And then we yell at them and then you know, we have to start over. But um, 
but yeah, the, the, the fact that these cells can live so long uh, in this uh, platform now allows us to study things that are a little more chronic. We can study the healing of, of the endothelium. We could study resolution of phenomenon, such as we know when vasal occlusion occurs, but what happens when it resolves? Because every patient, ultimately, they get better, right? So what is going on when they get better? And then thrombosis. Uh, because it's long term, we could study uh, clot formation and then even study the resolution of the clot thereof. So uh, this is uh, Yong Chu's work in my lab, and he's really shown that these cells are so happy that they, they set up shop, and they are really doing what they're supposed to be doing. So the endothelial cells are able to self-deposit uh, their own ECM in this uh, system. So they really think like they're, they're in the body. So they're producing things like laminin, they're producing things like collagen-4. And then here's a nice example of an experiment where uh, Yong has shown that when he has an occlusion uh, in this side here, the, the red cells are in yellow, and uh, he perfuses this molecular marker from the kind of the, the vascular side, and when there's leakiness, you see this uh, green stuff leak out. So we can use this as a way to study uh, endothelial permeability. So what are we doing now? Uh, so using this assay, uh, we've actually had several pharma companies uh, uh, contact us uh, to really figure out how uh, their mechanisms of action uh, work. So in sickle cell disease, there's a handful of uh, new drugs that are coming around the corner. Mechanism of action is still being teased out. Uh, so a few of these companies have reached out to us to use these as in vitro platforms to try and determine more sy uh, systematically what the mechanisms of actions of those drugs are. Okay, so switch gears a little bit. So that was all, a lot of the red cell stuff. So w our lab's also very interested in platelets and thrombosis. And how did we first enter this? Well, it was around the same time I was playing with these uh, endothelial microfluidics uh, with sickle cell disease. But as it turns out, we could use these things as a model for other diseases. So uh, in pediatrics, right, we, we see this uh, disease quite a bit, you know, hemolytic uremic syndrome, uh, HUS, uh, made by certain strains of E. coli. Right, as you guys know, releases these toxins, causes bloody diarrhea, but from a hematologic side, it causes the endothelial cells to secrete very large chains of uh, von Willebrand's factor. And that uh, then causes microvascular thrombosis, m often in the kidneys, and that's when you read about you know, these kids that eat bad hamburgers that end up uh, on dialysis. Right? So it turns out that you can get this shiga toxin, you can buy it, and I remember the first time I looked into this, there's a couple companies, and you know I just started the lab at the time, and you know we're on a budget, so I looked for the cheapest company that could make this toxin. It turns out that there's a very small company in Sarasota, Florida, called Toxin Technology, and a really small shop. And I buy it, and then I remember, yeah, yeah I'm leading up to something here. You guys know, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I get this call from my env environmental health, uh, uh, you know, EHNS, uh, from and I, I get this call and I say, uh, Dr. Lamb, I said, yeah, we need to see you at the loading dock now. I said, okay. And I show up and there's these three guys in hazmat suits and they're holding a box that has nothing but my name on it and the word toxin on it. And I said, oh, great. And then they open, I said, okay, I know exactly what it is. It's a shiga toxin. I said, what, what, what is that shiga toxin? I said, no, don't it's, it's, it's in vitro, you know, don't eat it, but you know, it's, it's fine. <laughs> and they open it up and unfortunately when they open it up, this white powder like spews out into into the air and I'm like, oh crap. And then they all look at me like, oh, I'm gonna get arrested, all right? Yeah, so, so I, I, I immediately called the company and I said, okay, uh, okay, A, um, you, you need more than the word toxin on the box. I think the word technology's got scratched out. And I'm like, okay, so you need a better printer and, and you need to not have whatever white dust you have in the styrofoam because it's, it's getting me in trouble. But anyway, the bottom line is that you can buy this shigatoxin. I would recommend another vendor than the one I used. Um, but all you do is you spike the endothelial cells with this toxin, and you start to see some of what we expect. So here uh, is just these endothelial cells stained with different fluorescent markers. This is uh, a stain for leukocytes and platelets. And what you see here are these little kind of aggregates that stick around. VWF is a long strand of stuff that, that platelets stick to, and you see a few strands here, and this is just a regular microscopy as, as the r rest of the blood is flowing through. So the shiga toxin 2 stimulates these um, uh, endothelial cells uh, to produce these small thrombi that, that occur. Now what's interesting is that in HUS, it's usually an arterial phenomenon, it's not a venous phenomenon. So what we can easily do is 
dial up the, uh, the, the flow to make it more arterial-like. And what you then see is even bigger thrombi that occurs. So that kind of doesn't make sense, right? Uh, when you think about if something's blowing in the wind, you would think if it's windier, there would be things that flow through more. That would make sense, except when you're dealing with von Willebrand's factor. So von Willebrand's factor is actually something that's called a, a mechanotransductive protein, meaning it responds to physics. Uh, so when there's high shear, when the, when the flow rate is really high, that's actually when these large uh, proteins of VWF unfold and activate. So there are almost like those, um, uh, you know, those Chinese finger traps. They're, they're, I, there's, there's probably a less racist term for that now. Uh, but whatever, you know what I'm talking about. It, 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 the more you pull, the, 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 the more of a grip it has. And that's very similar to uh, VWF. Uh, so we're able to recapitulate that in vitro. And again, we can uh, quantify these things. So we can start to look at thrombi size. And we can start using this as a, as a drug discovery platform. Uh, so this is in collaboration with Joel Moak in, in Houston, a uh, big uh, uh, microangiopathy uh, guy. And he said, why don't we use Integralin, which is a platelet inhibitor, to see uh, if we could attenuate some of these clots. And sure enough, we do see that when you use this drug, uh, the thrombi size decreases, and the effect is actually more pronounced when you crank up the, the flow rate and crank up the shear. Okay, so changing gears a little bit. What other technologies are we developing in, in the lab here? Uh, so any of you who are hematologists here, right? even if you're not hematologists, know that there's not a lot of great assays to study bleeding. Right? We know that there's all these little uh, kind of one tests, single tests that we can get um, that tell you one aspect of bleeding. You, know, you can get a platelet count. Uh, you can theoretically get platelet aggregation. There's fancier uh, platelet function tests, uh, platelet uh, function analyzers one. Uh, you can also get coagulation tests. But none, there aren't many tests that kind of combine everything together. There's something called a TAG, a thromboelastography, uh, but that has its own issues. So what we were really trying to do is recapitulate what's going on in vivo. Now there is this older test, that, for those of you who might remember this, uh, something called bleeding time, right? But um, it's A, pretty medieval if you think about it, <laughs> and uh, C, actually not that accurate because there's a lot of user-to-user uh, -user dependency, um, and even when you do it multiple times to, to get <laughs> better statistics, it still kind of sucks. Uh, so our goal here was really to see if we could recapitulate this scenario in in vitro. Can we create a channel here where we grow endothelial cells, have it be uh, very much like a blood vessel, and then can we create a mechanical injury such that blood bleeds, you know, with quotes around it, and then we watch the clotting that occurs. Okay, so what we do here, and I apologize for this uh, marker, I'll try to get that away. Okay, um, so what we did here is we actually made a, a system that has a kind of a, a, it's a valve, but think of it as a trap door. So when we grow endothelial cells here, we can actually rip open a little hole and that causes a bleed. And then blood will spew out here and then we can A, look at the uh, clot as it forms and B, measure how long it takes for hemostasis to occur, at least in vitro. So it's what we're calling our quote unquote in vitro bleeding time. Okay, so let me orient you here. So this is the, the vessel, so it's really small. We're talking 50 microns here. You're gonna see blood go from left to right. There's gonna be a rupture here. The, the, the blood is gonna spew out in this direction. You're gonna see platelets in red. You're gonna see uh, fibrin that will be formed at, in green. And then these are the endothelial cells. So this is where the vascular channel is, and this is kind of the, the bleeding channel. And then this will clot, and then you'll see blood just uh, continue in this direction. So here you go, from left to right, you see this injury that occurs with endothelium, you see almost a hole, you see all these red cells that are in gray spewing out, and you see the platelets form a nice plug there, and then you start to see uh, the fibrin that's formed. And then at some point, the whole thing kind of seals off. Right? So we can measure how long this takes. So this is our kind of in vitro bleeding time. Uh, when we look at patient samples, so in this case we use uh, hemophilia patients, uh, we see a marked difference. So in a normal person, uh, when you have this injury, you get platelets that, that form a plug there and you get a nice fibrin response and the coagulation cascade works. When you have hemophilia, you get a reasonable uh, platelet response, but you don't see any fibrin at all. 
And then when you quantify the bleeding time, we see this kind of difference. Uh, we, uh, healthy people are down here, and hemophilia uh, down here, uh, up there. So here's another example of an assay that we think has some clinical uh, translationable potential. Okay, so bear with me for, for the next few minutes, because I'm going to get uh, kind of into some nitty gritty basic science, but I'm, I'll spin it back to uh, translational stuff uh, at, at towards the end of this story here. So when I was a postdoc, when I was finishing up my fellowship, I was an instructor at UCSF, and I had this question of, can we start to use these technologies to really explore certain aspects of uh, platelet biophysics? And what part I was really interested in is something that I think uh, even we as hematologists tend to forget about. So we know that when there's a vascular injury, there's a platelet plug that forms, and then you get this fibrin clot, right? So uh, primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis. But then what happens is the platelets kind of intercalate with the fibrin, and the whole clot shrinks. And it shrinks down to like about like five to ten percent of its original volume. So it's it's actually a pretty neat phenomenon, at least from a physical standpoint. Uh, here you see this in vitro. So all I did here was took um, platelets, added some fibrinogen, added thrombin, which uh, uh, makes the fibrinogen turn into fibrin, and also activates the platelets. So you'll see this. This is a square cuvette, and over 25 minutes, you see this thing just the, the platelets just shrink, shrink the clot like crazy. Well, all right, for some reason want to do it anymore. Um, so this thing will shrink down to about, you know, 5% of its of the original volume. Let me go back here and show you again. Here you go. Shrinking down all the way. And then if you zoom in, this is uh, I'm in the microscopy, and you're looking at a single platelet in this net of fiber, and you see these little platelets kind of pull. Okay. So for my question, you know, as an engineer, as a physicist, I was really intrigued by this. I said, wow. We know that plates kind of do this, but I don't think we know much about the physics of it. Really simple questions like, well, well how strong is a single platelet? It's pulling. Uh, how fast does this happen? And is it a permanent process? So what I did, I went back to this atomic force microscopy thing, I, um, the record player. Um, but now I decided, you know, as finicky as that thing was, I wanted it to make life even harder for myself. And I decided to put a platelet in between the uh, the record player and the surface to try and convince the platelet to pull, and then that I would actually measure how strong a single platelet was. It was a huge pain in the butt, um, but we were able to do it. And the interesting things of, that we discovered, this is a few years ago now, is that when a platelet sees its clotting environment, it starts to contract immediately. And it contracts like crazy. So now that we can measure things, um, so these forces, uh, forces are newtons, nanonewtons, um, we can now start to compare uh, with other cells. So it turns out that platelets can contract with as much force as a muscle cell. So that's pretty amazing if you think about the difference in size of these cells. A platelet is like a thousandth the size of a muscle cell, but it can contract with almost as much force. It's almost as strong. So that was really intriguing to us. Um, secondly, we, as with these record player, as, uh, these AFM needles, we can change the mechanical properties of the needles themselves. We can make them stiffer. We can make them more resistant. And what it was really interesting to us is the more resistance we give the platelets, the platelets actually can sense this and they uh, exert and contract with more force. So there's some capability for the platelet to actually say, oh, okay, you don't want me to pull, I'm going to pull even more. Right? It's kind of like a teenager. Right, so uh, really obstinate, and the more you, resi the more you resist it, the more uh, force uh, it, it contracts with. So that was really intriguing to us. And, and now the thought then in the last couple of years is, can we take this phenomenon and try to study platelets at a higher level, higher throughput level, and then really pushing it towards the translational side of things. So uh, David Myers in my lab, a really brilliant mechanical engineer, what he wanted to do was not measure, measure single platelets like I did, but obviously a whole bunch. So he took a gel and he made these little dots of fibrinogen, which is what platelets uh, stick to, and then he made them into pairs of dots. And what happens is a platelet will land and it will activate and it will reach out over to the other dot and stick to it. And then the platelet will naturally want to contract. And as it contracts, uh, the, the two dots move. Um, and because we know 
the mechanical properties of this gel that it's sitting on, we can then determine the force. So this is back good. This goes back to your high school physics, where any of you remember something called Hooke's law. Uh, if you have a spring and you know what the spring is, uh, and as you pull on it, the distance that you pull is proportional to the force that's exerted. And that's exactly what we're doing for these single platelets. So here you see, uh, here's an example of all these little red platelets that are falling onto the sea of, of these green dots. And here's a single platelet here that lands right between these two dots and it pulls. And we then just track the distance these uh, single, these uh, pairs of dots move. So here's an example. Okay, maybe this computer doesn't want to show it. these two dots move closer together. It's actually the same platelet here. We just uh, took the red out for you to be able to see that we can track uh, these single pairs of dots. So when we do this many, many times uh, uh, with many different platelets, we can now determine uh, what the maximum forces are with platelets. And I, I think I told you before that the more resistance you give the platelet, the more force it exerts. And also from a uh, biochemical standpoint, if you activate a platelet, uh, there's dosage dependence. So if you add more thrombin, it also uh, exerts more force. So now we can actually study how all these things kind of combine together. And we're able to determine that there is a maximal force that a platelet can contract. Uh, this is just looking at different percentiles. And you know these are from uh, uh, 1,300 uh, different uh, platelets. So can we actually take this whole paradigm and translate this uh, to a clinical question. Um, so what we are able to do here with each sample, we're able to measure, so this is kind of like uh, cytometry for any of you who have uh, dealt with flow cytometry, certainly in our, the oncologists have. You're able to look at a whole population of cells and look at the frequency of a certain characteristic. So here we have cells that are from a single sample that are exerting at different forces and the frequency. So what you see here is a peak here, a mode of uh, certain cells that are at a relatively high force. But what's interesting is that when you take uh, a positive control patient, so someone who's bleeding, uh, so someone with something called Wiscott Aldridge syndrome that, that you guys probably know about, uh, they have a bleeding problem because the platelet cytoskeleton is screwed up. So what you see here is this marked shift in, in, your, in your peak to much lower forces. And then we got a few kids here who um, have uh, bruising, platelets, uh, issues, they're low platelets, but no real defined uh, diagnosis. And we see a shift here too as well. Um, one thing we have uh, spent a lot of work on is trying to see if the, the, this force measurement we make correlates with other platelet, uh, platelet activators and uh, markers of activation. It doesn't seem so. So this really does seem like an independent uh, marker that might have some uh, translational uh, potential. So working with uh, Carolyn Bennett um, uh, in our center, we came up with a fairly simple hypothesis. Uh, we, we see a lot of ITP kids over in Atlanta, and we wanted to see if this could actually be a biomarker for ITP, at least bleeding in ITP. So you guys know that in, in this disease, it's an autoimmune disease, low platelet counts uh, due to autoimmune destruction. Bleeding is a big deal. 10% uh, of these kids have a major bleed, and then out of those, 0.5% have actually a really life-threatening bleed, like an like a intracranial hemorrhage. Most kids resolve, but a minority develop ITP. Um, the typical func uh, platelet function tests are really hard to do because these kids often have low platelets, and when you have low platelets, that really confounds that test. So there actually is no existing biomarker that A, tells us who's at higher risk for bleeding, uh, related to who needs treatment, right? As you guys know, there's, there's different, different treatments, all the different types of side effects. Who will become a chronic ITP kid? And then now there's even talk in, in the uh, hematology crowds of there's a temporary kind of prothrombotic phase. Uh, so can this uh, contraction force measurement, something we call platelet contraction cytometry, help to at least uh, figure some of this out as a biomarker? So. The initial studies we, we did actually are pretty encouraging. So it's pretty preliminary. We have about 40 kids. And first of all, we found that platelet contraction force is independent of the platelet count and the mean platelet volume. 
And what's pretty interesting is if you just plot average force of all the kids we have, and here's their platelet count, and here's their mean platelet volume, so there's really no real kind of relationship in this direction or this direction, but all the kids in purple have some type of bleeding symptoms, and often these are wet purpura symptoms, so the mucous membrane uh, bleeding, um, and all the kids in black do not. And you see they, they almost kind of self-divide here right at this point. So that's pretty interesting. And if we look at that point, we say, wow, at least in this small cohort, there's actually 100% sensitivity, 91%. This is all preliminary. Uh, 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 we're still collecting data. But it, 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 it's intriguing. It's certainly tantalizing. Um, when we do what's called an ROC curve, where we kind of raster uh, this different, because this is an arbitrary point we're just drawing here, right? So what if we move this point back and forth? How does that affect your sensitivity and specificity? So this is uh, one of these curves. I'll, I'll walk you through it if you haven't seen one of these. So these are three things we're looking at. So we're looking at how good these uh, three markers are at detecting bleeding in ITP. So if you have a um, test that's basically no better than a coin toss, uh, you get this diagonal line. The perfect test would be one that does this kind of right angle up here. So it's, it goes up here and then here. So if you look at platelet count, because people often use platelet count as, as a bleeding risk, right? We know it's not perfect, but it's, it's the best we got right now. And it, it does kind of work, because uh, you see the red here kind of creeps up there. And then, uh, oh, excuse me, blue. Uh, and then people also, also talk about platelet volume. Right? There's a lot of talk in ITP about how these are baby platelets that might be immature, that might be a little bit um, indicative of bone marrow kind of spewing out, and they might actually be more hyperfunctional. So the, the presence of large platelets is also not a bad test either. But here's our test, uh, the platelet force. It's, it, it's, it's getting up there, so it's not bad. So we're pretty intrigued by this whole idea. And what's also interesting is that was only using average force. So we have a whole sample, and we're really combining it in one, into one number. But if we look at the entire population, like we do in cytometry, like we do in flow cytometry, we think there's even more information to be had. So here's a couple examples of these, what are called these histograms of, of force. Uh, here's healthy control. And then here's an, here are a couple of kids with ITP. Platelet count's less than 10. This kid has a platelet count of 24. Um, they actually have, the, it's a multimodal distribution. They have these kind of really highly contractile uh, subpopulations here. And if you look at a couple of kids that uh, also have low counts but are bleeding, they're missing this, this uh, subpopulation. So that's pretty interesting to us. We think there, there's a lot of stuff here, a lot of info we're going to try digging into. So basically platelets uh, from these ITP patients with bleeding symptoms lack this highly contractile subpopulation here. And if you look at all our patients right now, you again see that they that there's certainly a characteristic, uh, that almost a signature that occurs between your bleeding kids in purple and your kids that don't bleed. You get these extended populations that are of really strong platelets. Uh, so what are things we're doing right now? We're trying to figure out what, why? <laughs> we still don't know that. We don't know what the underlying mechanisms are. How does this link to the autoantibodies uh, in, in ITP? Don't know. We're still trying to figure that out. Yet. Okay, so I'm going to spend the last part of my talk actually talking about some of the stuff that's really translational and uh, stuff that my lab has been involved with in terms of uh, smartphone-based diagnostics and point-of-care diagnostics for a little while. Uh, so I first started this when I was a graduate student, actually, this is back when I was at uh, UCSF in Berkeley, and I helped teach um, my mentor's optics course. And this is back in 2005. And what we did was we told undergraduate engineering students to buy stuff off the shelf to see if they can make a cell phone microscope. And you can tell, you know, there's a cell phone here. It's, you know, it's pretty old, right? <laughs> um, but it turns out we could do it. And uh, they, after a couple of years, they were able to put a few things together and they actually had this uh, phone. Uh, this is a Nokia phone. And uh, Nokia, the company back in 05, heard about our project. And they were so intrigued that they sent us Hundreds of phones, actually, it's pretty cool. And, you know, because they were getting ready to take over the world, which they didn't. <laughs> uh, we made multiple different iterations of this. So the longer the tube, the more, the higher magnification you can get. So it was great. We said, oh, but wow, you can have this cell phone microscope. Great. So then everyone looked at me, because I had DMD, and I'm like, all right, what are we going to do with it, Wilbur? I said, oh, yeah, good question. I don't know. Um, so we had. Initial brainstorming, we said, okay, we got this thing. We 
got this cell phone. It hooks up to, uh, you know, just random uh, microscopy for it. So we can make a microscope into it. So it's a lot of things. I'm, you know, I was doing my fellowship. I said, well, obviously we could look at blood cells. You know, we can look at sickle cell disease. We can then start to look at other things in the blood. And you know, maybe we can do this for global health. Can we look at things like malaria, sleeping sickness, uh, tuberculosis, maybe. Uh, can we use this to actually enable remote physical exam? And so these were really the, the, the questions we were dealing with. And we we're trying to push in all these different directions. In fact, we even went to, to Africa a couple of times uh, because uh, we had colleagues who really wanted to use this to make smears, uh, thin smears from malaria. In fact, here's a nice story here. Um, this device we brought to Kenya and a bunch of grad students, myself included, and the guy that was carrying this was unfortunately the most disheveled among us and you know, really dirty hair, he's wearing this like trench coat. He, he was like this all the time. But he happened to have this when we went through security. And again, he didn't, you know, he, he didn't, he looked like a pretty shady guy at baseline, right? So, but in his bag, he had this thing. And in, you know, if you looked at that and you're a TSA guy, how is that not a weapon, right? So yeah, he got whisked away for like hours and hours. And then our take home lesson was, okay, Next time we go, the most clean-shaven uh, graduate student will carry this thing. Okay, so we were really struggling with, you know, which, uh, how, how to really have the, create the best value and what was the best uh, project to really focus on. And I had my first child at the time, and my wife uh, said, uh, and he had a lot of ear infections, and we would, you know, he ultimately had to get ear tubes, and whenever he had some symptoms, I would just look in his ear with my otoscope, and, and I would just you know, give him amoxicillin, sometimes have to go up to Augmentin. And my wife looked at me, so, uh, I clearly remember this, as a couple, he was a couple years old at the time, and she says, wow, so what do families who don't have a pediatrician <laughs> uh, do when they have a kid with, with ear infections? I go to an ER, and she's like, every time, like, well, that sucks. I said, yeah, that does. And she looks at me and she said, I'm really glad I married you. So that was the first and only time she actually <laughs> said that to me. Um, but it really did give, give, us, give us a thought, right? And, and the timing of it worked out. So this is around like in the mid-2000s now. And then right when, when 2009 came, you know, that was when the iPhone came. And we said, okay, well, maybe we have something here. And so what we did, this is back then when there was iPhone 3G and 4. I don't know if any of you guys have any of those or remember them. So what we did was we, we, took, we made an app, and, and that was pretty hard back then. <laughs> well, it, you know, almost anyone could do it these days, but it was pretty hard. Uh, so we, we struggled with it. We had to work with a lot of computer scientists, uh, grad students at the time. We made an app, made a 3D attachment, um, and what we did was we turned it into an otoscope. And we said, okay, maybe we'll focus on a, acute otitis media. Right? Can we give this thing to our families uh, who have kids with, with chronic otitis? Maybe even acute otitis. Uh, so, so this is what we were saying. Uh, we, you know, six, uh, 16 million uh, patient encounters per year. It's a lot of health health, uh, health dollar costs. Very frequent ER uh, diagnosis still is right. So, with those three points, we actually went to uh, VC, a venture capitalist, and remember this this is back in Silicon Valley at the time, and they immediately gave us a few million dollars to to start a company. It was oh great. Um, the images are not bad. Right? There's a healthy TMs. On the left there, you see ear tubes, you see a perforated TM, and you see infections on the right. So this is with 2009 phone technology, so it's not bad at all. Uh, so we got funded, and we started uh, making these things, and they went into many doctors' uh, offices who were interested in this, and uh, went to the hands of, of families. And here's, let's see, normal ear and infected ear. So it's not bad. Again, this is, so this uh, version is back in 2011 now, so still I think, I forget what version of the iPhone that was, uh, but it's not horrible. And you can see that, that the, the imaging you know, gets you pretty much what you need. Um, so we did an initial clinical assessment. Uh, we had a medical student basically just live in a couple of the ERs that were affiliated w with our center. And really the question was, is the uh, quality of these images sufficient for diagnosis? So what she did, she got, uh, doctors from with different subspecialties, got uh, attendings, uh, uh, ER attendings, ER residents, uh, pediatric attendings, pediatric residents, 
uh, ER fellows, ENT uh, residents, uh, ENT attendings, and to all look at a, a, a bunch of different images that she got both from our, what we call our cell scope and uh, a typical uh, otoscope that was camera fitted and got images there. And it turned out that there really wasn't any um, differences in terms of quality. So ongoing efforts now, uh, we have multiple studies, and I'm not conducting these, but there are multiple groups across the country that are uh, really trying to use this thing for remote diagnosis of ear infections. And an important question is whether uh, if physicians have this and are able to track images over time, can we get away with more watchful waiting? Uh, can we really track the images and say to parents, oh, you know what, your, your kid's ears are actually getting better, we actually don't need antibiotics in this case, so can we change the antibiotic practice patterns? Uh, so there's a, those are ongoing studies right now. And then as a training tool you know, for med students, residents, nursing students, and so forth. Uh, so this is all great, um, but I remember I have yet, I had yet to have my mom actually congratulate me on anything until she saw it on TV when it actually went on uh, Stephen Colbert's ear. So she finally called me, she says, I'm proud of you. I said, you know what, I don't think I've ever heard you say that. But okay, fine, I'll take it, I'll take it, right? I've done a few things before that, but okay. <laughs> um, okay, so then in the last couple minutes, I'll, I'll talk about a couple of the point of care diagnostics that my lab is really interested in right now, related more to hematology. So this uh, project really came, came about when I was a fellow at the time. So I was still at UCSF, and I remember bumping into this girl. She was getting a chronic transfusion. Uh, she was chronically transfused, so she was, she was getting transfused at the time. And I remember clearly, I think I was just a first year fellow at the time. I'm very happy to tell you I still look the same. I don't look any different than what it is a clinical fellow. Uh, but anyway, this uh, girl uh, came up to me, and I had just gotten my PhD. Okay, so it must have been a couple years. That picture, I was a first year fellow, but I think I must have been a like, senior fellow at the time. And she looked at my tag and said, Hey, you have a PhD. I said, Yeah. She said, You have an MD. You know, she's getting transfused, so I'm just walking back and forth. And then she goes, well, what's your PhD in? And I said, oh, okay, well, bioengineering. She goes, oh. Again, a few minutes later, I walk by her again. She goes, so you make stuff, she says. I said, yeah, I do. And walk by her again. She goes, I have a project for you. I said, oh, oh really? Okay. I said, what, what? Okay. All right, I'll hear you. you know, what, what, what do you got for me? And she says, well, my sister is diabetic, and she has this thing. I want you to make me one, but for my blood, for my anemia. And I said, immediately, I immediately blew her off. I'm like, yeah, silly girl, right? Uh, no, 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 because when we as hematologists draw your blood, when we're getting a complete blood count, we're looking at a whole bunch of things, right? We're looking at platelet count, we're looking at white cells, we're looking at a whole bunch of stuff. We're not just looking at your anemia. And she says, no, 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 no. Three months ago, I was admitted. You were the boss doctor at the time and you told me you were really deciding whether I could go home or not based on what my hemoglobin was. And I said, oh, crap, she's right. <laughs> so there are certain instances very much where we really are mostly looking at the hemoglobin. So I went home and I remember thinking, okay, basically she gave me as an engineer design criteria. Uh, so she wanted something that she could use at home. It was really simple to use. Uh, ideally didn't have any other equipment that's fast and cheap. So. I came to Atlanta, and this is a project that was always uh, eating at me, and I gave it to one of my amazing undergrads, and she actually created this, this test. Uh, she created a, a, chemical, a biochemical test at, that achieves all of those, uh, those goals. So the way it works is you prick your blood, it goes into this tube, and it goes into this reagent, and it, the reagent mixes with the drop of blood, and based on what the hemoglobin level is, uh, it changes color. So kind of like, you know, you guys all have swimming pools here, right, in Phoenix, right, your, your litmus test uh, for, for your, your pH in the swimming pool. Very much analogous to that. Uh, so it's not bad. Sensitivity and specificity is not bad. Uh, so we published this, and I remember in lab meeting one day, um, I was thinking, wow, if we're really only looking at color, it seems like we can make an app for that. And I had a couple of uh, really brilliant uh, undergrads in my lab at the time who were really good at coding. And I was looking at this one kid, and I'm like, I'm right, right? I mean, we can make an app for this. And he, he shakes his head, and he says, yeah, Dr. Lamb, I, I think theoretically you're right, but the problem is I have a final tomorrow, so I won't be able to do it until Tuesday. So then on Wednesday, <laughs> he created this, he showed up with this thing, and sure enough, yeah, he can make an app for that. 
and that increases our <laughs> sensitivity and specificity uh, significantly. So, so boom. So, uh, we have a startup company, and it, this is now uh, officially commercially available. Now, we've got FDA cleared. Uh, but from a research perspective, I'll, I've always been really intrigued by whether we could do this completely non-invasively, right? Because you guys all know when we assess someone for anemia, we're looking real qualitatively at a certain things. We're looking at their palmar creases, we're looking at their fingernails, looking at their conjunctiva. I said, can we actually develop a way where we quantify this and maybe we can get away with no blood sampling at all? So really you have something like this where you have an app and you take an image and boom, you, you, you get a hemoglobin level. So this guy, Rob, uh, was an undergrad in my lab and then became a graduate student in my lab. And he has beta thalassemia major, and he's chronically transfused. And he's a brilliant computer coder. And when it came time for his PhD uh, thesis project, he said, well, I want to do something on myself. And I basically said, well, you know what? I think you're the best person to test this hypothesis. It's super high risk. There's a bunch of stuff that go, can go wrong but you are chronically transfused every month. You get CBCs all the time. Why don't we, why don't you, here Rob, here's a phone. Take pictures of every part of your body you can think of. And go numerous cycles, record your, we'll record your CBC values, and then throw, and you're, you're a computer science guy, right? Just make an algorithm, right? Throw every single algorithm you can at it and see what you get. So he did that for a few cycles, and he showed me this data. And that's when I said, okay, I think you have your PhD project, right? Once he showed me that R, it was like, you know, 0.99. Um, and what it turned out, uh, so obviously we had to convert this from something. There are certain aspects of the metadata that's embedded in these cell phone images, specifically from the fingernails. So I told, I told you he took pictures everywhere. It was the fingernails that actually worked out the best. And for, for numerous reasons. So, uh, you know, I was really worried about skin tone changes amongst different people. Well, it turns out you actually don't have as many melanocytes in your fingernail beds uh, as you, yeah, everyone's looking at their fingernails right now. Uh, <laughs> uh, when, uh, and, and that amount of variability uh, really r remains pretty conserved across different people. And, and he has the data to back it up. Like all these other body parts, the variability was crazy. But it, with the fingernail beds, it really uh, worked out pretty well. Uh, so here's how it works where we have an app now. You just uh, cl click an image, use the fingernails. We use the flash. And the flash is nice because it normalizes the lighting conditions quite a bit. And right now we're trying to automate this. But as of right now, uh, you manually click on your fingernails and then you just push go. Uh, so what Rob did was he uh, had this giant database. It worked well on him, so, but he collected hundreds of other patients from uh, different ages, so our geriatric clinic we went to, an internal medicine clinic we went to, uh, we're now looking at neonates, obviously our hematology clinic. Uh, so really creating this, this algorithm that can predict, based on fingernail images, what someone's uh, uh, hemoglobin is. I mean, it's not perfect. Uh, so the sensitivity is like still at 90 right now. Uh, but what's neat is that he now has a system, so we published this a few months ago, where every time he uh, accrues a new patient, it immediately goes into the database and it's getting smarter. So it's, um, so with every uh, patient, you know, the sensitivity and specificity is improving a little bit. What's also very interesting is that this algorithm that he has can be calibrated and individualized uh, to each uh, specific patient. So the accuracy then uh, becomes even, even higher uh, because the algorithm will kind of weight um, the calibrated uh, CBC values of chronic anemia patients. So if you had maybe four additional CBC values with uh, fingernail images, that will actually individualize the algorithm to increase the, the accuracy. And, and with that, here's an example of four patients with their own individualized algorithm. Uh, the error now is, is, is pretty good. We're getting errors that are well below single grams per deciliter, which, you know, even as a hematologist, we would say is pretty acceptable for, for true uh, diagnostic. Okay, so I think it's 8, okay, not bad, 8.30, right on time. Uh, I think I'll conclude. So what I really hope to have imparted to you guys in this last hour is that there are these new technologies coming around the bend. Smartphone technologies are here to stay. They have a lot of translational potential. From a basic science standpoint, I hope to convince you that physics matters with cells and that 
yeah, these physical aspects of cells may actually be translatable as well. But I'll take any questions uh, for now. Thanks.